to shout it, you might as well shout it now. Get comfortable shouting how great your God is. How great your God is. I'm telling you, my God is great. My God is great. My God is great. The Bible says I give seed to the sower. I believe that God puts, gives things to people that are doing something with it. I believe that God pours into rivers, not reservoirs. And when he sees that I got a dry clump of dry bones giving me praise and giving me credit and crying out to me, listen, I'm drawn to that dry bones. I, I want to know more about that. How about you come back to life a little bit? I like what you're saying. I like what you're shouting. Maybe that's the recipe. You got a struggling marriage? mind's all messed up. You got a past you can't overcome. You're just a bag of dry bones. I'm telling you, start praying and start prophesying and start worshiping and start crying out. Great is my God. But you don't know. Great is my God. But I remember where you came from. I know. And that's why great is my God. But you're just a, you're just a whole bunch of dry bones. I know. That's why I'm saying great is my God. Because I should be even less than this. And great is my God. Great is my God. But, but what but what have you done? I know what I've done, but I also know where I'm going. And because I know where I'm going, great is my God. Great is my God. Because I know my future. I know God has a purpose for me. I know my God has called me. That's why great is my God. Jonah over there smelling like a fish with seaweed around his neck saying great is my God. You don't know where I've been for the last three days. Out of the belly of hell I cried out to my God and my God heard me. He took me down to the lowest part of the earth and my prayers still had a way to make it. I'm preaching right now. My God there's something coming over me. My prayers made it to heaven and because I can cry out to my God in the belly of hell and they still make it up to heaven great is my God great is my God great is my God great is my God my God you gotta give me a bigger church I gotta run these aisles I need to punch a hole in the wall there's something coming over me I'm telling you great is my God I will look at my enemy and cry out great is my God great is my God great Trump thunder and for you to start telling your testimony. You're waiting for God to heal everything before you start telling people about your relationship with God. I'm telling you, you need to start telling those people about it right now. Right now, let me tell you where I've been. Let me tell you what I've done. Let me tell you about what I did last night. And by the end of my sentence, I will tell you about how great my God is. Everybody wants a testimony that's 20, 30, 40, 50 years old. That's not what God has given the heritage. You've got a testimony that happened on Friday. My God. 
God. You got a testimony that happened yesterday at 1.30 p.m. I'm saying get up, tell your story, tell your testimony, and before you are done finishing your sentence, let everybody know, but great is my God. I'm still alive today. Great is my God. I've got a greater future than my past. Great is my God. Oh, my God, I believe it. That is the story, and that is the mission of heritage. That's what we are. You want to come and be led by a pastor, by a group of people that have a 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 year old testimony? No, they got a testimony from last week. I thought I could wear a short sleeve shirt and that would help me today. I'm sweatier today than I was yesterday, last week. My God. I think it's the blue lights. I think it's with the blue lights. My God. Oh. What do you think, Jess? Is that it? Or do you got you got something more? What do we think? My God. That worship changes things. Because worship changes the atmosphere walk into something and you just know it's going to be good walk in a restaurant smell it look it like i just know this place is going to be good worship shifts atmospheres i walk into my morning tomorrow i go to work and just know god's going to be in it why because why would god be in my sunday but not be in my monday why would god be in this small building in south omaha and not be in my house in my basement my God is omnipresent. My God is everywhere all the time. Worship shifts atmospheres. My God. I don't know. Just, just give us a second to figure it out. So just in your own ways, with your eyes closed, lift your hands if you're comfortable. Just have your own moment with God. You can talk out loud. You can pray quietly in your head. Just soak this up. Just soak it up. Soak it up. Some of you need to take some of this home with you, so just soak it up. Go home and ring it out. Ring it out in your house. Ring it out in your office. Ring it out on your husband. Go home and just say, I've been sitting in the presence of God for the last two hours. I'm just soaking wet full of the presence of God. Go sit right next to your loved one on the couch and cuddle with them. Maybe a little bit will rub off on them. Just soak this up, my God. all over the place but you are the one thing that remains consistent <clears throat> and God every single week we can come into this place and just throw caution to the wind and just be spontaneous and just let ourselves be open to the moving of the Holy Spirit and every single week you move in a spectacular uncommon unnatural way it's natural to you it's unnatural to us this is not what we get to experience every day but yet there's something, I'm telling my God, we can, when we come into this place, we can step from the natural into the unnatural, from the natural into the supernatural. And that's what we're experiencing today. God, thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the moving of the Spirit. Thank you for the Holy Ghost. My God. Giving us the ability to do the things that we cannot do on our own. Thank you for the Holy Ghost. Empowering us and, and enabling us. Thank you for the Holy Ghost. 
Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Singers, wonderful. Thank you. So, Haley, good job today, Haley. Haley had a nice little solo. We love it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to get into our, our, our worship is not done. Our worship is not done. Our worship goes to another level right now. You know, a lot of people talk about, you know, religion and stuff. And I think I've, I've been talking about this a lot lately. Jesus did not come to establish a religion. Jesus is not a religious figure. Jesus is a political figure. Jesus is a king. Jesus is a king. And we don't understand. We live in a democracy, so we don't understand much about kings and kingdoms and but Jesus didn't, Jesus didn't come to set up a, some religious. He came to set in place and put in place a kingdom. <clears throat> and, and there are, there are some, um, we don't understand much about kingdoms. But let me teach you something. Let me, let me learn you for a minute because it's really powerful. <clears throat> if you lived in a kingdom, and I was actually reading about this. But if you lived in a kingdom... It's royal etiquette to never enter a king's presence without bringing a gift. And I, I was actually Googling some gifts that people have brought kings. I forget who it was. I thought like Michelle Obama brought Queen someone. A whole bunch of like old D, uh, uh, VHS movies. Obviously there's something there. I don't know. But you never would go into a king's presence and not bring a gift. And It's just what you do. And this moment right now... When you are about to bring your gift, I want you to understand that this is not a religious moment that we do between the worship and the preaching. This right here, this right here is a moment where you get to bring a king, you get to bring a gift to a king. And this is where you get to place value on a king, and I'll explain that. When you would go into a kingdom, when, we, when you would bring a gift to a king, your gift would tell that king how much you esteem him. You hear that? Gift, your gift would tell that king how much you esteem him. And I know this is new to you because this is not how we this is not how we live, but in the kingdom, this is how they would live. One day Jesus was sitting and he was watching people who were giving their their offerings, and and uh, and, and in came a, a, a woman who gave a widow's mite. And Jesus looked at his disciples and said, Hey, see that woman? And he told his disciples, he said, She gave more than any of them. Now clearly she gave the least amount of money. Uh, the amount was different, but the sacrifice was greater. And he said, she gave out of her economy. She, she gave out of her poverty. All these other people are coming in with all this money. She, they're giving out of their surplus. She gave more than them because she did not give out of her surplus. She gave out of her poverty. And so the amount doesn't matter. It's the sacrifice and the obedience. And I like what King David said. King David said, I will bring nothing. This is, this is incredible. I just want to teach you for a moment. King David said, I will bring nothing to God that did not cost me. And I know I just sent my singers down, but do you hear that worship? He said, I will bring nothing to God that did not cost me. Brad, Mark, anybody that's serving here. Back and back there, all my musicians, Kathy, anybody, uh, uh, Leanne, Mickey working in the food. Never show up bringing something to God that did not cost you something. Even if it's your blood, sweat, and tears. David said, I'm going to never show, I'm never going to show up and bring something to God that did not cost me. He says, if I'm going to go before God with, then I'm gonna, with, with something, I'm going to feel it. I'm going to feel it. Why would I bring something to God that didn't matter to me? And why would it matter to God if it didn't matter to me? So, I was reading about these kings and this etiquette thing, and, and here's what I found, and I'll, I'll read it. When kings would meet each other, and when they would bring their gift to a king, their gift would display their, my gift to a king. If I would give my gift to a king, my gift to the king would display my glory and my wealth. So when you bring a gift to a king, you say, this gift is for you. But look how fancy it is. Look how big it is. Look how pricey it is. That's because I'm a rich king. So even though it was a gift for Mark, my gift will be done in such a way that I get the glory. I get the credit for it. Wow, he's wealthy. But then the king that received it then will give back another gift to that king and say, hey, I want to show you that my glory is better than yours. My weight is better than yours. My wealth is better than you. So then Mark would turn around and give me a gift that was greater than my gift. And that's how it would, that's how it would happen. Could that be? We 
know that Jesus is a king. Could that be why Jesus says, give to me and I will give back to you, pressed down, shaken together, overflowing. Because when you bring your gift to a king, when you bring your gift to a king, God says, listen, you're going to bring me a gift. Well, listen, I'm going to give it back to you, but I'm not going to let your gift outshine my gift. So he says, when I, when you bring your gift to me, thank you for your gift, but I'm going to take your gift. I'm going to press it down. I'm going to shake it together. I'm going to make sure it's overflowing, and then I will bring it back to you. When we come to this moment, we're given to a king, and not only does your gift show how much you esteem your king, but it puts a demand on his glory. Hear that. When you bring your gift, whether it's on tithely or however you want to do it, your gift demands that your king repays you. And because he's a king and he will not let his glory be outshined by you, he said, I will, you put a demand on my glory, I will pour back into you, but I promise you, it's going to be greater than what you gave me. Amen? Does, does that make sense? You may not have, you may have a hard time understanding that because that's kingdom talk and we don't, we don't live that way. But the Bible says, give to me and when I give back to you, I will give it back to you. Press down, shake it together. That bad, that bad boy will be overflowing and I will pour it back into you. That's what your God does. That's what your God does. That's why when you give to God, you're not giving up anything. You're actually exchanging a little for a lot more. And we're going to give you an opportunity to do that. You see behind me, you can give your gift here today. So many people use the tithely app, do whatever you want to. But make sure you get, get that gift to that king. So when it comes back to you, it comes back greater. Let me pray over it real fast. God, I pray that you'll bless the gift and the giver. God, we may not understand how this king thing works, but, I, but I've been reading, I've been Googling, and I know that when I bring a king, a gift to a king that my gift esteems that king but then that king there puts a demand on his glory to give back to me and your word said that I feel like if I give to you you will give back to me press down shake it together overrunning will you pour into my bosom my God I need that I believe on that so my gift will go into the ground today knowing and believing that when it when it comes back into my life it will be greater than what I sowed I pray that you'll bless the gift and the giver in Jesus name amen amen Facebook don't go anywhere too far. You guys can give your gift now. You can hop online and give it through the Tithely app. Give it any way you want to. Just get that seed into the ground. gracious. I have had the best two compliments last week that I probably have ever had in my life concerning about what we do here at Heritage. I had, I had a, a group of people, we were kind of talking in the back, and, and, and I was just the odd man out. They knew each other. I didn't know who they were. They were introducing me to them, and one person looked at the other person, and he said, I didn't know this place like this existed, you know? And uh, that's the second time I've had someone say they didn't know a place like this existed. Well, when you take this and you shove it into a small building in South Omaha, not a lot of people know this place exists. And, uh, and, and, and God has a way of taking horrible things, COVID-19, that shuts us off and, and, and turns them around and spins them through Facebook and through you guys sharing and putting out that message. We're reaching people that did not know we were here. And uh, people are showing up, and that's the second time. I had another lady here one time, and she said, I didn't know a place like this even existed. And that's shocking to me, and that's sad to me. And uh, I'm not a church goer. I don't, I, mean, I don't go to other churches. This has been my church. There was one time where I was going to another church when Ashley and I were getting back together. We went to another church, but I went there, and then I came here. And it wasn't like this. 
And well, I mean, maybe, maybe to some, this is a bit much, you know, the jumping and the shouting and the, you know, the, you know whatever that is. Uh, I don't know. It just comes out of me. I don't know. I don't sit at home and practice my shout. It's just what happens. I think what it is, is for years I've been a drummer and I've not been able to um, let that frustration out. I'm telling you, I squeeze this microphone so much. I told Sean a couple weeks ago, one of these days I'm going to punch a hole in the wall. I mean, you know, for no other reason. I just, I'm just overflowing with this, whatever this stuff is. And, and, uh, um, and then I had another conversation with someone last week, and they said, my goodness, I've not been in a church service like that in years. And I know, I know, I know that, and this is funny, I, can, I guess I could probably use this to transition to my message. <clears throat> I know what we do here is probably, I don't know if it's, if it's, if it's common, if it's uncommon. I know it's a lot, um, but I couldn't have it any other way. Consider this for a minute. Consider this. When we were kids growing up, and if you've grown up in the church, I'm just kind of looking around to, to who are my, my young churchgoers. We had church on Sunday morning, and uh, it would run. We, we wouldn't start till 11, but got, we wouldn't get out of this place until 2 o'clock, right? You remember those days? Uh, and we'd have runaway services, what they called them, runaway services. We would have services where it was worship the entire time. In t the entire time. Uh, so we'd have Sunday morning services. We would come back at 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock and have Sunday night services. We would have Wednesday night services. We would have ladies ministries, which was like a service in and of itself. Uh, we'd have uh, Bible studies. We'd have men's Bible studies. We'd have week-long revivals. We don't have that anymore. We don't have that anymore. And, and I even thought about this. I, and I just, I just thought it and just kind of swirling around my head. I got to wait for it to kind of work its way down. Um, but uh, that's just kind of how it is. Um, but I even thought about maybe it's time that we have a revival here at Heritage. But because I think that will set this place off. But I got I to gotta be able to take these things off these pews. And I know a lot of things opened up in Iowa this week. Like everything's open. Are there churches 100% in Iowa? Uh, my gosh. So we'll just have that spill over. And... Um, over here, so we could do that. But we would have week-long uh, week revivals. Camp meeting was like a week long. And uh, now we kind of just brought that down and, and, and brought that all the way down to uh, like a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday deal. We'd have prayer meetings. Um, what else would we have? We'd have all types of stuff. Huh? Someone say, uh, um, we, we'd have uh, prayer nights. We would have all types of stuff. I remember one time on a Wednesday night, we had a, a mighty move of, of God down in our, in our basement, down there with a, with a young adult group. And we got done, and before we all got married and had kids, we would always go to Village Inn. You, anybody a part of that back in those days? We'd always go to Village Inn. Then we had kids, and everything got pricey at Village Inn. You know, if I'm going to spend 50 bucks on food, I'm not going to do it at Village Inn. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to do it at Village Inn. So we stopped doing that, and also my bedtime. Is nine o'clock, so how can I go to Village Inn at ten? And uh, you laugh, but that's the truth, you know. And and uh, um, but one time we went to Village Inn, and, and and I remember Chad, my brother Chad, came over to me and said, "Hey guys, let's go back to the church because the moving was so incredible. Let's let's go back to the church and, and we can we can do that." And 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 what was happening during that time is. It was hard to be in that constant environment of, of holiness and righteousness and power and the Holy Ghost. It was hard to be in that constant state in that environment and continue to think like the world. Continue to live like the world. If you, if you find yourself falling away and, and beginning to think like the world and live like the world, it's because you have been slowly... And, and, and kind of separating yourself. And my, my best analogy that I have is, and I would, I would fish, and I've been watching a lot of fishing shows on ESPN because there's like no other sports on. And so like fishing was on, and it was like competitive. It was like I'm watching competitive fishing. But I like to fish. But I, but I had a boat one time, and it was so funny because when, when you're, on, when you're fishing, fishing from the shore, you know, you're trying to fish it out as far as you can. But then when you have a boat, you're trying to fish into the shore, you know. But you'd have a boat, and you would, you would fish along the shore, and then, you know, you'd get kind of bored of that. And so you would turn your back and start fishing, you know, out into the lake. And then you would turn back and you realize, oh my gosh, I drifted so far away from the shore. How'd that happen? Well, how that happened was, is you took your focus off of the shore. You took your focus off of the only thing that was constant in your life. That could preach right there. You took the land was the only thing that's constant. The land was the only thing that's permanent. And you took off the only thing that was standing still. You're all over the place. You took your eyes off of that. And so what happens is, is when you're in that constant environment, you're doing really, really good. But then what happens is you lose a Friday night service. You lose a Wednesday night service. And now we've condensed things down to uh, like a, like a three-day camp meeting. And, and now we don't even have small groups. And, and we're trying to bring that back. But COVID's kind of messed that up. I would tell 
tell you this. I know some of you guys like our Wednesday nights, what we do back here, and maybe we'll get back to that, but can I just tell you, could I just, I'm trying to have reach. I'm trying to, I'm trying to reach people, and lately, Ashley and I go live on Facebook on Wednesday nights, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, Jesse Hollenbeck, you in here? No? Um, and uh, I want to have Jesse come do that one, one of our times with us. But we get there and we'll have 20, 25 people engaging with us on Facebook. And really that's more than people than we would have back here, you know. And so I don't really know how to give that up or how to, how to, how to adjust that. But it's new people. And it's not even just, it's just a few of you. We have a lot of people that engage with us on Wednesday nights that we don't typically have. That even, would even they don't even come here. They don't even live in the state. They actually even attend other churches. But they, they always seem to connect with us on Wednesdays. And so even our small groups that are Wednesdays. Wednesday nights have just been really, really broken down. And we, we've, we've, we've crushed everything into like a special, you know, we come to church and we want to have an hour church service. I'm getting somewhere. Hang with me. We, we come to church and we want to have an hour church service. You know, it, when, when Ashley and I and when Sean and Jesse and Mark and Laura Lee, that was the starting six. That was the six people that got together and we said, hey, uh, you guys, I think we're going to try to pull off a, a, a nine o'clock church service here. And that was when my dad was still here and, and he was doing the, uh, the 11 o'clock service. And then that's when we reached out and got Kathy and Chuck involved. Jordan started coming. Uh, Mickey started popping in. I'm just kind of looking around people that were com uh, coming into that. And, um, and we had to run our services from one to, from, for, from, from nine to uh, 1030. So we had an hour and a half. That was it. And that was a struggle. That was a struggle. Why? Because we, we, tried to, we tried to slim everything down to 30 minutes of a worship and maybe 30 minutes of a message, if that, once you talk about all these other announcements. And, and so you want to come to church and have an hour experience, and all of a sudden that one hour or the hour and a half worship service and, and message, all of a sudden that is going to offset every billboard you've read this week? You want to come to church? Again, we don't even have church like we used to have. Now we basically have one made church service on a Sunday. And you want to come to church and have an hour and a half service? And that's supposed to offset every magazine you read? Everything you saw on TV? Everything you saw on the internet? You want to come down to the altar and want me to pray off, you know, and, and give me a 60 seconds to pray everything that life has put on you this past week? It doesn't happen that way. It doesn't happen that way. And so we come to church and we have these moments. You have to realize that, that we live in a society and we live in this world system that is designed to get its tentacles wrapped around you so tight that you spend a lifetime trying to unravel them. Right? I don't know if I, don't know if I can get it together, but uh, VH1, for the old people, I don't know if people even watch VH1. I would imagine they do. But when I was a kid growing up, VH1 was for the older folks. And right underneath VH1, which is Viacom, right underneath VH1 is MTV. And then right under MTV is Nickelodeon. Nickelodeon. And then there's even a Nick Jr. Did you know that? Did you know that they're all part of Viacom? And what they're trying to do is even at the age of three, four, five, they want to wrap themselves around you that you will follow from Nick Jr. to Nick to MTV to VH1. And I don't know if you've seen MTV lately, but it's, you know, it's like sitting on a popsicle stick type thing. I mean, it's just horrible. I don't even know what I'm watching right now. I mean, it's just, it's just a hot mess. But we live in this world system that everything is designed. Have you been on Facebook and just been like scrolling, not even really reading much, but all of a sudden you're like, you're just in this crazy trance? We live everything that's around us is designed to get its tentacles into you and not and never let you go. And so we want to come to church and have, and again, an hour, an hour and a half, and two hours. And, and we do two hours, and that sometimes is tough. Jesse called me this week, and she said, Brad, you know, I've, I've been adding another song in a worship. Are we okay for time? I said, yeah, Jess, we're doing okay for time because we give the Spirit to do whatever He wants to do from 10 to 12. <laughs> from 12. And so if, if the spirit is going to move and then if we have to change our announcements or whatever, we can adjust. We can adjust. But we, but we have to do that. And sometimes even two hours is not enough. Why? Because for 70 hours this week, you have just been in, just been surrounded. You go to work and some of you, you know, uh, uh, no, uh, Jonah said, I cried out from the belly of hell, from the belly of the fish. Some of you are working in the belly of hell. Every day, all day, your job is just, it just pollutes you and it's just negative and just bitter people. And it's just a rough environment. Sometimes I have to go to work and just plead the blood of Christ for me and say, God, you've got to shield me from negative people and negative thinking. I've been telling my boss, I will, I will pay for this. You know that extreme home makeover edition, whatever, whatever it is. They send, they send people away for a week and all of a sudden they come in and I say, I'm going to do that to my boss. I'm going to send her on a golfing retreat. I'll say, I'll see you on Monday. I'm going to call some builders in and build me an office. 
office real fast. And when she comes in, I'm like, hey, surprise. I just want, I just want to go to work and be left alone. And so when I come to work here, this is all we get, Marcellus. This is all we get. Where are you going with this, Brad? Sometimes, and this is all we have, but sometimes it, it demands more than this. If we are ever going to really make a change, make a change. You can't look at the things you're looking at. You can't do the things that you're doing. You can't say the, talk the way you're talking and pop into church and fill a pew for an hour and a half and then leave and never raise your hand, never put a hop and a jump, never clap your hands, never shed a tear and expect that you're going to walk out changed. I could never go to the gym, Aaron, and look at weights for an hour and a half and walk to the mirror. It's like, man, how, how'd that do, man? How'd that do? I can't do that. I can't. I look like a fool. I was helping Ashley move a picnic table yesterday, walking by my windows. She said, well, every time you walk by a mirror, you look at yourself. I was like, well, this table looks pretty heavy right now, you know? You just worry about you. You can't go into a gym and just smell the weights, you know? You got to pick them up. Don't you come in here and just sit there. We're all acting a fool. I've been preaching about being called. And I'm going to talk about repenting. And that seemed like a strong, scary word. And as a church member, as a grown up in the church, when people would say, repent, the kingdom is near. Repent, Jesus is coming. I would get this, and I don't know, maybe it was just me, but I would get this feeling that repent because you're an evil person. And if you don't repent now, you'll die and go to hell. I, uh, Tanya and, and, and Teresa, I would wake up in the morning. Mom and dad are gone. No one's answering their phones. The rapture came. You call Kathy and Connie. If they don't answer, you're screwed. Yeah, you're, done. you're done. I don't know if I can say that, but your, your mom and dad, no one's answering the phone. You think, you think the rapture came, you called Connie, she don't answer. My God, I got one more person left. If Aunt Kathy don't answer, the rapture has come. Pack my bags. I'm done. Hello? It's Kathy. Hello? Aunt Kathy? Yeah? Whew. Just making sure the rapture didn't come. Just making sure the rapture didn't come. We had preached this message about repentance. And I don't know why, but I would have this icky feeling that repentance meant I was an icky person. Oh, I could feel the Holy Spirit. And if I had to repent, I was a horrible person. If you don't repent, you'll die and go to hell. And the more I study, the more I learn, I realize that repenting is having a change of mind. Because there is a call to repentance to get saved. You come here, you repent, you get baptized. We missed in June, we always do a baptism. We can't do it. I'll find a way. Do the whole water gun super soaker thing I think I saw on Facebook. But there is, there is a call to repentance to get saved. But then there's a call where God is saying, I want to use you so bad. I've got such a plan for you. It keeps me awake at night. Does God sleep? I don't think so. I can't sleep. I can't eat. I'm constantly thinking about this call I have for you. And I need you to repent. I need you to have a change of mind so you and I can do this. The word call is often used and it refers to God's initiative, God's invitation to bring people to Christ. So Marcellus, people are called to come to Christ. They're called to the cross. They're called to salvation. But then there's an, an, there's an additional calling where it's called, where we are called to participate in this ultimate plan and purpose of God. So you're called to Christ. You're called to God. And, and I look, when I, when I was studying, I feel like there's like a three phases or three dimensions of a calling. There is a call to come. And there's a call to go. And I feel like in that middle, there is a call to conform. I want you to come to me because I want to send you somewhere, Abraham. I want you to leave your father's house. I want you to leave your country. I want you to come to me because I'm going to take you to a land that you've never seen. I'm going to show you. So there's a call to come to me and, and there's going to be an invitation for you to go somewhere. But in the middle, there's going to be a call to conform. There's going to be a call to change your thinking, to change your behavior. There's a call to repentance. There is a purpose and there is an intent for everybody in this place. I feel like it's so heavy in here. 
There is a purpose and there is an intent. God, the psalmist said, he said, I cried out to God who fulfilled his purpose in me. There is a purpose in you. And God, by the Bible says that we are all being called to a holy calling. All means all, and you are a part of the all. So we've all been called to this holy calling. There is an intended end. There is an intended outcome for every season of your life. Bull, you lie. Because there's no way there's a purpose to the season I'm in right now. But Ecclesiastes 3 tells me that there is a season for everything and every season has a purpose. You understand that? If you don't leave with anything, leave with that. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 says that every, everything has a season and every season has a purpose. And what you're going through right now, even if you can't seem to wrap your head around it, even if it doesn't make sense to you, there is a reason for this season. I didn't mean to rhyme that. I was almost about to stop it. <laughs> there have been times in my life where I have wrestled with God saying, God, I think I could have planned a better road than this. Dude, are you really all knowing? Because it looks like you've lost your mind. I could have done this better. But let's just be honest with ourselves. If you could have done it better, you would have done it by now. I'll take you down to the depths. I'll, I will swallow you with a fish to get you to realize you need my help. You can't do this on your own. I will shake you. I will throw you overboard. I would, you know this story. I have prayed. Uh, a con I, I, often I say the same prayers. I often, a long time prayer of mine has always been this. God, use me as an example of your rich kindness. That's always kind of been a prayer of mine. And I remember praying, God, uh, let me be the best version of Brad I could be. You know, let me be a better husband, a better father. I went and I went and I, I probably won't get through my message. Just let me just be in this moment. All right, thank you. Someone said, come on, I appreciate that. I went and I want to be a good dad. Is that all right? Don't cry, Brad. I'm not, Aaron. <laughs> I want to be a good dad. And I found myself on a, on a Thursday, and I really tried because it's a struggle because I, I've preached this before, and I love my mom and my dad, but they, had a, they struggled to pastor, and God has given Heritage and myself a phenomenal group of people and helpers and work. Just Bob, just earlier, trying to fix a stupid tray on a TV. Bob said, Brad, you got other important things to do. I'll fix this tray. I said, Bob, thank you. Thank you. God has given heritage to such great people. My mom and my dad didn't really have that. And subsequently, my, my brothers and I, sometimes we took back seats to church people and the church families. And I can't do that. I've got this week, I think three or four coffee or dinner dates with church people. And I want you to know, and if you're one of them, that happened, but just so you know, that that got worked around my family schedule first. So that's good. Because my children are my first disciples. No. Yeah. And so, I told Ashley how to walk away from that one. <laughs> I said, babe, I need a new lawnmower. Yeah, I don't care what you get. You might care when I get it, you know. <laughs> it was free, you know. Because I would go home on a Thursday, and Thursday's my lawn night, because I, I want to have my Saturdays free to do family stuff. And, and there's more than just to mowing and weed whacking. You got trim trees and bushes and stuff, and I got a lot of stuff going on in my house. So I went and got, if you know anything about this, I went and got a, I had a big mower already, but it was like a residential 33-inch cup. But I went and got a 36-inch heavy-duty commercial skag mower. I don't know if you know anything know about skags. It's a big boy. Uh, it's such a big boy that's a bit intimidating. And the first time I mowed, it kind of got away from me and climbed a tree, you know, <laughs> chopping a tree. I was like, oh my God. You know? <laughs> it was, I'll show you the tree, the, taking divots out of the tree. I told Ashley, I said, but babe, I think this is just, I think this will cut my yard so fast. And, and, and it's kind of about it used, because new, they're like $6,000. If you know anything about those mowers, it's like a car. And on Thursday, I went. And I was able to mow and trim and clean up some rose bushes and pull some weeds. I got so much done. That way on Saturday, I was free 
to do what I needed to do to be, with, to be with my kids, to be available to my kids. I don't know why I'm preaching this right now. I have no idea. And so what did that look like? Well, Cameron and Ashley and Cooper were gone. And Colin comes downstairs and says, Daddy, you want to jump on the trampoline? I said, yeah, because I have free time. Because I bought a new mower to free up my Thursdays. Because what was happening was I was taking my mower and it would take me two and a half hours to mow my yard. Two and a half hours to mow my yard. I have a big yard. In two and a half hours, I couldn't get anything done. So my Saturdays, I was going around doing other yard work because I can't handle time. And so I told Ashley, if I could just get everything done on a Thursday, then my days are free on a Saturday and I could be a father to my kids, you know. So he said, you want to jump on the trampoline? And we jumped on the trampoline. I was doing flips and I was even sticking them. <laughs> Colin was like, no, dad, you have to do it like this, you know. So he was showing me how to do it. So we're doing it. And then when he got done, he said, I'm thirsty. I said, I am too. Let's go to Sonic. Went and got a Route 44 blueberry slushy. It's too much sugar for me. <laughs> it's too much, man. Went and did that. I was just being a dad. I just wanted to be a dad. That's all. I had to go pick up Cameron. I don't know why I'm preaching this. Why in the world? I had to go pick up Cameron over at Aunt Christina's house. We had to do some running, some errands. I stopped at my work. Nobody was there. I said, you want to drive my car? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? We did it in the parking lot. <laughs> I said, you keep your foot on that brake. Don't you take your foot off that brake. We'll do pushing the gas next time, you know? So all I did was push, let the, let the foot off the brake. We just kind of drove around the parking lot. I just wanted to be a dad. I just wanted to be a good dad. There's a calling on our lives. And as much as there's a calling on my life to be a prophetic preacher and a passionate preacher, there's a call to be a good husband and to be a good father. I don't know why I'm preaching this, and I don't know why this is so heavy on me, but there's a calling on your life. And you may not understand the calling, and I know where we're going. You may not understand the calling. You may not know why you're going through the season that you're in, but Marcellus, I prayed that prayer. God, I want to be a good dad. God, I want to be a good husband. And God took me down a road that I, that I argued with him. Uh, I could do this better. But that road of despair, that road of struggle, that road of depression, that made me to this. Last week we talked, we were talking about Jonah. And, and last week we preached about how there was Jonah and the story of Jonah and the well. And what that is, is that's the struggling of, of, of two wills. The will of God and then the will of Jonah. And we, d we discussed how in God's great foreknowledge, God, he made room for Jonah's uh, um, stubbornness and made, made room for, for his, his, his hard-headedness. And I made the statement how, how bad, my God is a bad God. Maybe some people look at God as this measly, small, well, I don't know what he is. My God, he's just a, he's just a bad dude. And, and as a matter of fact, that statement has offended people before, but that's fine. That's your God. My God, he's, my God is a bad God. My God is such a bad God that he can let you be a bonehead and still get you to do what he wants you to do, you know, and still come in at the end of the day, still a accomplish his plan. My God is so good and so great and he's so smart that he can still let Brad go do Brad things and still by the end of this day still accomplish what he wanted to accomplish with Brad. God makes room for your mistakes. God makes room for your failures. Now listen, I really want to, I want to kind of maybe hunker down on this for a moment. Don't go out and if you are going out and you're intentionally making a mistake, it's not a mistake. If you're going out and intentionally living that way, that's not an accident. It's an accident because it wasn't meant to happen. Can I tell you that I'm a righteous person? Can I also tell you that I'm not a perfect person? Can I tell you, righteousness is, is holy and upright living according to God's standards. You know, I am that way. I like to think that I'm a righteous person. I like to think that I'm a man of integrity and morals. When I bought that lawnmower from, from this buddy, and I, uh, and I said, hey, man, um, I said, I, said, I, I, I want to buy it. I didn't bring any cash with me. And uh, I said, so I got to go to my house and, 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 and pay you. He said, no, I'll just drop it off for you. Just pay me later. I said, well, I appreciate that because I am a man of integrity. 
I am a, I am a man of morals. I, I, I'm a, I have good ethics. But can I tell you that although I'm a righteous person, I'm not a perfect person. And I make mistakes. I make accidents. It's not intentional. It's not the way that I am. And God is so good. And God is so great. And His mercies are so merciful. And His grace is so gracious that even understanding the human side of Brad, He says, Brad, I'm going to let you still be human and still accomplish the purpose of the plan I have for your life. God tells Jonah, you're going to go to Nineveh. He says, I'm not going to go there. And he attempts to flee. And he attempts to relinquish the call of God on his life. And I'm just recapping. Sean, when you come, just come by yourself. There's just kind of a, a different vibe today. Sorry, praise team. I know, I know you guys have to come back for that. Jonah, Jonah thinks if I could go to a completely different part of a, a country. I don't know. I should have looked. Is, 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 is. Tarshish, a different country, it's a different land. He said, I don't know. He said, I'll go to a different, completely different part of town to relinquish and, to, and to, to get, get, get off the call of God off of me. Get off of me. That wouldn't work. I'm swimming in the belly of a fish at the depths of the earth and still could not relinquish the call of God. I'm telling you, we have all been called and we've been called to a holy calling. You have been called and until you accept that calling, you will never find peace. You will never find comfort. For the rest of the days, you'll be walking around wet and smelling like fish. Until you accept the fact that there is a divine calling on your life and you say yes to God, until you do that, until you repent, until you change your mind and quit fighting God, you will never find peace. You will never find comfort. You'll never find fulfillment. And you will go, and that's what happens. There's a lot of people that go from church to church to church, bar to bar to bar, pill to bottle to bottle to can. They're trying to find fulfillment. Why? Because there's something. The Bible says that when we do something that's contrary to the Holy Spirit, we grieve the Holy Spirit. They're trying to find something that brings them peace, and they can't find it. Why? It's because there's a mighty call on your life. And until you step inside that calling, you'll never find relief, Jonah. I will chase you down. I will rock your boat, Jonah. The Bible says that Jonah cried out to God out of the belly of Sheol. Sheol means hell. Jonah said, I'm not in hell, but where I'm at right now is like hell. And I made the statement that not everything in your life is devils, demons, and witches. Some, Jonah said, God, you were the one who cast me into the deep. Your floods surrounded me. Your billows and your waves passed over me. He didn't say the devil did this. Jonah said, God, you did this. You caused the chaos. Why? Because you had a calling on my life. I was trying to run away from that calling, but you would not let me go. And one thing that we learn is the extent that God will go to to keep you in the plan and the will of God my God we, we talked about I, I do have a new message I'm just recapping I do have a new message I got to get into it God, I'll get into it now I'll get into it now my recap was good it was going to get better but I got to get into this Romans chapter 14 verse 17 Beck the kingdom for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking it's not about stuff so stop making it about stuff I'm going to throw something at you it's not about hats in the sanctuary sorry I got mad there did, that, did I intimidate you Todd? I didn't mean to intimidate you it's not about that it's not about donuts it's not about coffee it's not about that the kingdom of God is not about your tattoos. The kingdom of God is not about your motorcycle and your crazy beard and your biker's vest. Now, it's not a vest, whatever that is. It's a vest, whatever. I'm not a biker, Chuck. They wouldn't accept me. I tried. The kingdom of God is not about you smoking cigarettes. It's something you should get over, but the kingdom of God is not about that. It's just unhealthy. Unhealthy things don't grow. Healthy things grow. But that's not about the kingdom of God. 
He said the kingdom of God is not about eating and drinking. It's not about stuff. It's not about things. He said the kingdom of God is righteousness and it's peace and it's joy in the Holy Ghost. That's what the kingdom of God is. When you talk about the kingdom of God, you're talking about the influence of God, the ways of God, the reach of God. And I know it's hard for you to grasp because we don't live in a kingdom, so you don't understand how the kingdom works. But a king lives in a palace. His kingdom is everything. It's the extension of his authority. And Jesus preaches about the kingdom. And he tells him, he says, may your kingdom come. May your ways come. May your will and your agenda, your plans and your purpose. And God is saying, why I'm here has nothing to do about your stuff. Has everything to do about righteousness and peace and joy and the Holy Spirit. What happens is, is a lot of times we put a lot of emphasis on these things and we try to capture stuff and we try to capture things and we try to capture them all in the name of the kingdom to try to justify it. Well, the kingdom wants me to have this. Where the kingdom wants me to do this. And what we end up doing, Marcellus, is we go after the stuff first. The Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God. And all of these things will work out for you. All of these things will be added to you. The Bible tells me that when I seek the kingdom first, I never have to worry about stuff. I never have to worry about things. I never have to worry about food. I ain't got to worry about my life. I ain't got to worry about my job. Why? Because I've sought the kingdom first. But what happens is, is often we try to go after those things and the stuff and the cars and the wealth and the jewelry and the houses we get them and then we try to back them up into the kingdom and we try to make them fit into the kingdom but my God said that's not how it works because the kingdom is not about those things so Paul made it clear he said this is Paul Paul's saying this here's what the kingdom is about you're, 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 you're losing your mind he said, Here, here's what the kingdom, the kingdom, for the kingdom of God is not about eating and drinking. It's about righteousness, peace, and the joy of the Holy Spirit. Now, that's what, that was Paul's message about the kingdom. Let me tell you about, let me tell you about a forerunner. There's a forerunner named John the Baptist. I got 12 minutes. There's a forerunner named John the Baptist. Let me tell you what John the Baptist had to say about the kingdom. He said, repent, because it's coming. So that's what he said about the kingdom. He said, he said, God's ways, he's talking about the Messiah. He's talking about Jesus. Jesus is God in the flesh. He said, hey, get your mind right because the kingdom is coming. We lost the kingdom for a little bit. Adam screwed things up. But Jesus is coming. The Messiah is coming. The ways of God, the authority of God, the rule of God, the extension of God, the influence of God is coming. A righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit is coming. So he says, so repent. Get your mind right because it's coming. It's coming and it's and it's coming to you righteousness is on its way to you peace is on its way to you joy is on its way to you but I believe that there's someone I prayed this week I was working yesterday and I don't know where I was maybe I was just driving I said God give me a message for somebody tomorrow something unique I know I have this but but there's I need I need an exclamation point and I believe that God gave that to me that when we talk about repentance, and I said this earlier, I believe that God is telling me to tell somebody today, you've got to say yes to God. And not in a way, not in a way of salvation, not like, yes, you will you become my savior and I plead the blood of Christ and I repent. Not that. I'm saying you've been saved, you've been called, but you've been fighting and resisting God. And I believe that somebody needs to hear this morning, hear, needs to hear me say, it's time for you to stop fighting the calling that's on your life and say yes to God, Jonah. Stop running away. Jonah stop doing that Jonah say yes to God why because the kingdom is coming your peace your joy your righteousness the influence of God is coming you got to say yes to it the call from John the Baptist that was a call remember there's there's calls there, there's a call to come there's a call to go and there's a call to conform in the middle and and John the Baptist is making a call and he's saying hey you need to repent and he's not saying that you need to repent because you're a sinner he says you need to repent because the king is coming the kingdom is coming and repentance needs to be your response 
Not, oh, I'm sorry, you better repent because he's you're gonna get in trouble. No, the kingdom is coming. The call on your life is coming. The kingdom is God, listen, peace, joy, righteousness is coming. You're up, something's coming, Marcellus, and you need to get your mind right. And that's what God did to Abraham. God said, listen, Abraham, I need you to leave that country. I need you to leave that place. I need you to leave your family, your father's house, and I need you to come with me. I need to get your mind right. Why? Because the kingdom is coming. I've got a plan for you. I've got a purpose for you. There is a, there is a calling on your life, and I don't need you to repent to get saved. We'll deal with that later. I need you to change your mind because I want to use you. Before God could use Jonah, he was trying to use Jonah, but Jonah would not be used by God, and he kept on resisting God. And so God said, Jonah, I'm going to have to go to extreme lengths to get you to change your mind to say yes to me. And I believe that's a message for somebody today, that there's something stirring inside of you and you're resisting it, but you need to say yes to God. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh. God told Abraham, leave your country, leave your father, leave your father's house, leave it all. And he said, why? Because I'm going to take you to a land. I'm going to show you a land. He said, I'm going to make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. He told Abraham, you're going to have an opportunity to be great, Abraham. You're going to be, you're going to have an opportunity to be blessed and to be a blessing to other people. But first, in order to qualify you and to get you into position for what I'm about to do, you need to repent. You need to change your mind mind Abraham you know, we've been waiting for God to bless you and to take you places and to show you a land you've never been to you don't understand why God's not doing it he said because you have to position yourself you gotta change your mind you're, you're, you're fighting me you're resisting me repentance is not apologizing apologizing is saying I'm sorry for what I did but you can apologize to God and yet have no intentions on ever changing your behavior. You can go down to the altar and truly be sorry for everything that you've done. You can ask God to forgive you of your sins and he will forgive you of your sins. But to receive the kingdom, to see the land that God wants to show you, Abraham, you need to step into the fullness of God and his purpose for you. And in order for you to do that, you, and in order for you to accomplish this divine opportunity, you've got to repent you've got to change your mind John the Baptist said you can't get the kingdom he said you got to change your mind you got to repent you got you're thinking so crazy you're thinking too wild he says you're not gonna get the kingdom and keep your mind thinking the old way Jesus said I'm the new wine that's what Jesus said he said I'm the new wine he said you want my new wine you want the fullness of me you can't put new wine in old containers he said you're gonna have to change something John the Baptist said the same thing if you want the kingdom if you want the kingdom if you want the fullness of God if you want the rule and the authority of God if you want the Holy Spirit you gotta change your thinking can't take your John the Baptist was saying you can't take your belief system and your carnal mindset and mash it through the kingdom you can't come dragging your life and your lifestyle into the kingdom because the kingdom is a lifestyle I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping up five minutes five minutes five minutes is this good we all right okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Mom, making me blessed you know, I learned something, and maybe you haven't learned this, because I know I'm, I know we got a lot of good people out there. But I have found myself before in my life where I would take the teachings of God, take the teachings of the Word, and I would try to conform them and try to align them so they align with Brad. Well, you know, one of the hardest things to do is when you feel justified to do something, not justifying yourself to do it. I'm kind of, I'm just going to make this truth in the Bible. I'm just going to kind of squeeze it. I'm going to try to run it through the Brad filter, the, the Brad strainer, you know. See what comes out on the other end, you know. Just see how this works. And we all have a Brad, but your Brad may be called Bob. Your, your, your Brad is Matt. 
Oh, we all have we all have acquired certain mindsets and we all have these behaviors from what we've been through, from what we've experienced, from what life has taught us. We've all we've all been developed. The world has developed us. I, I talked about that when we first opened. You want to come to church for two hours and undo everything that life has done.